goodness and for your mercy. Now, God, as I stand, I ask that you anoint these lips of clay. God, I realize that without you, I can't do nothing. God, I realize that without you, I am nothing. So, God, I need you to release your anointing. Release your anointing in this place, God. God, we thank you for what you've already done. And God, we thank you for what you're going to do. God, I ask that you hide me behind the cross and cover me there with your hand. As I sit down, Lord, I pray that you rise up in me, God. God, I pray that you speak a word to your people, oh God. Speak a word that brings life. Speak a word that brings deliverance, God. Meet the needs of your people in this house on this morning. Now, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We do honor God, who is the head of our life. We give honor to our pastor and to all whom honor is due. There's this song that I've been singing all week, and I just ask that you join me. It's an old familiar hymn of the church, and I just ask that you join in with me if you know it. There are some things I may not know.
thank God for being real in my life. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing when you can go from worshiping and serving your parents, God, to worshiping the God of your own salvation. I thank God that he's real in my life. Verse 15 says, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly require all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent the messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. Verse 19 says, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Verse 20 says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Amen. The word of the Lord is already blessed. We have your seats. I want to talk from the subject entitled, It Worked Out For My Good. It Worked Out For My Good. One of the hardest things to do in this life is to admit when we've wronged or offended someone. For pride has a way of getting even the best of us. Thus making one of the simplest and most powerful phrases one of the most underrated and least said phrases in the English language. These two simple words have repaired broken homes and broken relationships. These two simple words have mended broken hearts and broken spirits. A remorseful plea of these two simple words have been beneficial to even the common criminal resulting in receiving a lighter sentence. Although these words have been replaced by hip catch phrases such as, we good, my bad, my fault, we're and we're straight, nothing, however, beats a sincere, heartfelt, I'm sorry. The word sorry, according to the World English Dictionary, is defined as an exclamation expressing apology, used especially at the time of the misdemeanor or offense. To be sincerely sorry about an offense goes beyond just saying, I'm sorry. When you're sincerely sorry, not only are you acknowledging the offended's feelings, but you're also taking ownership of the part in which you played, resulting in why they feel that way. Growing up a tomboy with a brother and male cousins who used to torture us girls in order to, as they say, toughen us up, it kind of made me or us a little tougher than the average girl. And it caused me to develop this nonchalant, like, oh, toughen up, man up type carefree attitude about most people and most things. But one thing I had to learn is that when someone expressed to me that I offended them or hurt them in any way, no matter how simple or minute I thought it was, was that I couldn't say I'm sorry if you feel that I offended you. Because clearly I had or else they wouldn't have said it. So in turn, I had to do a self-check and acknowledge that whether intentional or unintentional, that I too had to go back and make things right. And instead of saying, I'm sorry if I offended you, my tune changed to, I'm sorry that I offended you, wronged you, or hurt you in any way. Our text on this morning deals with a family who could have been the perfect model for a Dr. Phil show. Maybe a Mari Povich show. Maybe even a reality show. This family had gone through a whole bunch of drama and a whole bunch of changes. 
In this scene, Joseph and his brothers had returned from Canaan after the death and burial of their father, Jacob. And his brothers were fearful because they had thought and remembered how they hated him. And they remembered all the terrible things they did to Joseph years ago when they were younger. And now they were afraid because they're just so sure that now that their father is dead, Joseph will seek revenge against them. So they came up with this plan and they sent a messenger to Joseph because they want him to believe that Jacob left word for him to forgive his brothers before he died. While Jacob was alive, they felt safe. But as soon as Jacob died, they immediately became suspicious of Joseph. Why? Because they were being haunted from the guilt stemming from the actions of their past. That's why it's important, especially being children of God, that you keep a clear conscience. Because a guilty conscience can cause you to live in continual fear, even when there is no need to fear. So they sent word to Joseph, and when Joseph heard their words, the Bible says that he wept. Now, in order to really get the significance of this text, you have to go back to the beginning of this story in Genesis, the 37th chapter. Joseph was the second to the youngest son of Jacob. And verse 3 of that chapter says that Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children. Because he was the son of his old age. Yes. Not only was he the son of his old age, but he was also the firstborn son to him and the wife that he truly loved, Rachel. And one thing that I've learned is that when you accomplish or achieve something that at one point seemed impossible or something that you're passionate about, is that when it comes to fruition or comes to pass, you're more careful and you tend to take more time out and you tend to nurture it a bit more and appreciate it a bit more because it's something that you work so hard to achieve. And that's how Jacob was towards Joseph. And when his brothers saw that their father favored Joseph over them, verse 4 says that they hated him. Joseph learned at an early age that being favored will cause folk to hate you. Not only was Joseph Jacob's favorite, but he had a special gift and calling on his life. Joseph was a dreamer. And God sometimes used dreams to inform people of future events, to warn them of danger, or to provide information that they would need in order to accomplish his will. And in Joseph's case, the dreams that he had indicated that he was destined for greatness, more so than his brothers. But they also signified that God had his hand on him and caused him to do a special work. And because Joseph had a pure part, a pure heart, he didn't see anything wrong sharing his dreams with his family. But I guess in a sense you can sound, kind of say that's where Joseph made his mistake. He shared his God-inspired and God-given dreams to people who weren't spiritual. And one thing that I've learned is that, we, that you can't tell your dreams to everybody. Why? Because everybody can't handle your God-given dreams. When God gives you a dream, there will be people who will try to take over it, well, talk you out of it, yeah. talk against it, or yeah. seek to rob you of it. And sometimes it's going to seem like your God-given dream is impossible, but there's no need to get discouraged because Philippians 1 and 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's right, that's right. So the price he had to pay for making known his dreams was opposition, yeah. rejection, and even hatred from those he loved the most and was raised up by God to help. So they plotted to kill him. But instead of killing him, they buried him alive in a horrible pit. Then he was delivered from the pit only to become a slave in the home of a complete stranger. Next, circumstances arose where he was forced to use his God-given talents in order to enhance another person's wealth. After that, he was promoted because of his faithfulness, only to be falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. All because he chose to remain a man of character and integrity. Yes. Not only did he choose to remain faithful to God, but he chose to remain faithful to Potiphar as well. But her advances toward him became so much so to the point that one day he just had to haul off and run. Yes. And she grabbed a hold of his garment and she tore it. And she told the men of the house that he had violated her, that he had raped her. There are going to be times in your life where you're going to find yourself in situations and circumstances that your only way out in order to avoid damaging your character is to run. Yes. But even in your haste to get away, you have to be careful of what you leave behind. Because the devil will use your stuff as a tool to frame you. 
And that's what Potiphar's wife did. And because of her false accusations, he was sentenced to a dungeon. Now, while in the dungeon, he befriended another prisoner who just so happened to be the chief butler to Pharaoh. And while they were in prison, he comforted the butler with the prophecy concerning his release and his restoration. And Joseph's only request to the butler was that the butler remembered him when it was well with him. But of course, the butler forgot all about Joseph. And it wasn't until when Pharaoh had a dream some two years later that the butler remembered him. Somebody needs to be encouraged on this morning to just hang on in there and know that God doesn't do anything by accident. He's very intentional and he remembers when people forget. And even when they forget, God will bring it back to their memory at the perfect time. Just like he did in this case. Because if you really think about it, people dream dreams every night. But Pharaoh wasn't just any old man. Pharaoh was the ruler over all of Egypt. And this was the very thing that God used Joseph to bring him to the place that he needed to be in order to fulfill the will for his life. And it was because of his divine gift to interpret Pharaoh's dream that Pharaoh placed him to rule over or be in charge over his house. And in the midst of his elevation to a position of prestige and power, Joseph was reunited with his family and provided for them. He buried his dad, but it was also during this time that God used him to bring his brothers to a place of repentance, which sets the scene of our text. When they came to Joseph after Jacob's death, they were scared because they didn't know what to expect. It's kind of like when you were little and you did something you had no business doing. And you knew your parents knew about it, but they weren't saying anything. So naturally you were shook or you were scared because you knew you deserved to get it. But because of their response to you, you wasn't really sure what was getting ready to happen to you. So you end up finding, finding yourself trying to figure out what their thought process was, which turned into you trying to come up with ways to talk yourself out of getting in trouble. At least I know that's what I did. And that's what Joseph's brothers did. And they were scared, so they found a way to try to talk themselves out of trouble. So they sent words saying, Dad said to do right by us, and Dad said to look after us. Anyone with siblings know that when you preface a statement with, Mom said do this, or Dad said do that, whether they actually said it or not, you knew that your brothers and sisters were going to do it. Why? Simply because Mom or Dad said it. And that's how Joseph's brothers were. They figured since he was dad's favorite, he'll do it if he thinks dad said to do it. Yeah. However, it was never in Joseph's heart to hold their past over their heads. He had forgiven them a long time ago. In fact, we have no record that he harmed anyone, nor is it recorded anywhere that he held a grudge against anyone. So after they sent messengers to Joseph, and when they came and, down, and bowed down before him, the Bible says that Joseph wept. And he tells them, there's no need to fear me because I'm not God. And eventually, he's the one that you have to answer to and face for all the wrong that you've done to me. But it's what Joseph said next that makes this story so remarkable. In one verse, Joseph looks back over 30 years of trial and triumph. And he acknowledges God's hand in every detail of his life. And he said unto them, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. Yeah. Joseph didn't pretend what his brothers did to him wasn't evil. Yes, it was evil. He didn't have to wonder how they felt about him. He knew exactly how they felt about him. He knew their motives. After all, he was there when they betrayed him and sold him as a slave. But Joseph saw deeper than their intentions. And that's the same mindset that you have to have. Yes, you're going to go through, and yes, there will be circumstances and people that will almost force you to want to abort that which God has birthed in you. Uh -huh. But you have to look past their plots and look past their plans and see the bigger plan, which is God's plan. All of us at one point or another have been there because when you think about the will of God, you think about everything being good. Very seldom do you think about it being a struggle or it's a situation that forces us out of our comfort zone and forces us into situations where you are broken, bruised, and sometimes treated in a way that most of us cannot deal with. But in spite of all the opposition and in spite of all that's being done, just know that God is doing something far more wonderful. Yes. I'm reminded of an episode while watching the NASA Space Channel one night. And they were showing space missions. Excuse me. 
And they explained all the parts or the purpose of each part. And one of the parts that they talked about that really stood out to me were the rocket boosters. And the rocket boosters are located on the side of the space shuttle. And the space shuttle is purposed or designed to reach very high altitudes because it goes out of space. And because the space shuttle has such a long way to go, even before it reaches the halfway mark of its destination, it needs a little boost. So what the rocket booster does is it powers up and it pushes the shuttle off the pad and into the air. And once the space shuttle has fully powered up and it reaches a certain altitude, the rocket boosters fall right off. Why? Because that's a part of their purpose. It's all a part of making a process of a successful shuttle takeoff and mission. So many times we despise going through hurtful situations and the seasons of opposition and rejection and the seasons of trials, but you need to realize the fact that everything that happens to you as a believer is there to help you. It doesn't always feel good to you, but it is good for you. Because Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And once you recognize and set your focus on God's plan, you'll be able to rise above certain situations and rise above the haters and rise above being despised and despising those situations and those encounters. And you'll think of them as boosters and you'll welcome them as tools that will help push you into your destiny. So just know that every lie that was ever told on you was good for you. Every person that ever walked out on you was good for you. Every hurtful situation that you endure and every hater that you encounter were all good for you. Why? Because if you didn't go through those situations, you would never know how much pressure you could handle. Pressure is actually good for you. So many useful products are produced as a result of being put under pressure. If you don't put pressure on an olive, you never get oil. If you don't put pressure on a grape, you never get juice. If you don't put pressure on a child of God, you will never get an anointing. The pressure that you are dealing with shouldn't come between you and God. Instead, it should draw you closer to him. For it is the depth of your suffering that determines the height of your anointing. Trouble is only a part of the process that God has chosen for you. For Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. See, you got to stop looking at what you're going through and start focusing on where God is taking you. Yes, that person walked out on you. Yes, you're going through a period of opposition and rejection. Yes, you lost your job. Yes, they're lying and scandalizing your name. I know it doesn't feel good. I know you want to walk away. I know you want to throw in the towel. I know it seems like where you are and what God said are worlds apart. But if you just hold on just a little while longer and do a harness as a good soldier, everything will be all right. Yes, you're going to cry sometimes. Yes, you're going to struggle sometimes. Yes, you're going to encounter opposition. Yes, you're going to encounter haters. But you must recognize that this is just a part of your faith. Anything that God has called you into, there's going to be a trying of your faith. Trying faith produces character. Trying faith produces wisdom. Trying faith produces patience. Trying faith produces maturity. Trying faith produces obedience. For Hebrews 6, 11 and 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's why you have to have sure enough faith in God. And you must trust him to complete the work that he started in you. You got to trust him when you can't even see him. You got to trust him when you can't even trace him. You got to trust him even when you don't know what his plan is. And while you're trusting him and while you're waiting on God, remain prayerful, remain praiseful. And while you're waiting, develop the character or develop the habit of encouraging yourself. Don't wait for nobody to say, oh baby, you can make it. Because that may never happen. But instead, find the biggest mirror in your house and tell yourself, I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am a lender and not a borrower. I am victorious. I am an overcomer. I am blessed. I am somebody. Because I'm a king's kid. And when you feel like your situation is going to make you lose your mind, stand right in your mirror and tell yourself, God will keep me in perfect peace.
Just for your good.